All right, I think uh, we may begin. My name is Anna Vasilieva. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a director of um, a Graduate Initiative for Russian Studies, um, the project that um, allows me to invite uh, top level experts, leading experts on Russia in the former Soviet Union here to the Mont Monterey Military Institute. And um, uh, today uh, we have with us uh, Matthew Rajansky, who I believe is one of the thought leaders in the country on the subject and uh, one of the most dynamic uh, uh, figures in the field. Um, Matt has extraordinary career already behind him and uh, uh, you know he created uh, the uh, section on Ukraine at Carnegie Endowment of International Peace. He worked on Transnistria issues. Um, uh, Matt is very involved in the Dartmouth uh, dialogues uh, and uh, you know is truly active uh, uh, you know and that's what we need these days you know people who uh, do what they believe in. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you all saw the biography, uh, you saw that um, uh, Mr. Rajansky is director of Kennan Institute at Woodrow Wilson Center, and my students know about George Kennan and uh, the legendary figure and uh, someone I admire. And uh, uh, generations of my students read books and works by Kennan, and one of the remarkable achievements of him as an expert, I believe, is that uh, George Kennan uh, didn't get um, iced in his views, didn't get stuck with the views on uh, the Soviet Union, you know, and that was all because of the extraordinary education uh, that he received, you know, for those of you who don't know, you know, not only he had to know Russian language, Russian literature, but uh, um, his uh, State Department supervisor, uh, when he just began, began the career, made uh, um, Kennan and his cohort study the whole curriculum of pre-revolutionary Russian gymnasium because he said you just have to be able to know what they know. And only then, only then, those young specialists started to study politics per se. And so, in a way, this is what we try to emulate here, of course, with a very limited time and possibilities. But, uh, you know, the fact that today we have the director of Kennan Institute, who, in my opinion, manifests all the greatness and expertise that George Kennan contributed to the field of Soviet slash Russian studies. Um, it's wonderful. I hope our collaboration will continue. And um, uh, today's topic, I know it went a little bit backward, uh, behind, uh, you know, the back burner with Syrian events. But uh, those of you who were here at um, uh, Dr. Arbatov's lectures, you remember his response uh, uh, to some questions that were asked when he said that he is much more concerned about Ukraine than about Syria because they. Uh, if there are indeed clashes between the United States and Russia, then he believes that the most dangerous ones, if they occur, would be on the territory of Ukraine. And so the topic uh, is uh, uh, very appropriate for all of us who study uh, Russian affairs, and I welcome Matthew Rajansky. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, so uh, after an introduction like that, um, I, I feel like probably uh, I need to find another speaker and introduce him very quickly <laughs> because uh, I'm not going to live up to it, but I am very grateful uh, for the invitation to be here, um, to be among some old friends uh, who I find here um, have lucked out to find their way to, uh, to Monterey, um, and then of course to be back in California. I'm, I'm a California boy. Um, it's so funny how in Washington, uh, if they uh, find a kind of fast-talking uh, guy who does Russia stuff, they automatically assume you're from New York. But no, quite the opposite. Uh, I was born in Alamo, California, Contra Costa County, a bit north of here. Used to have the highest horse-to-human ratio in the country. Um, and, uh, and I'm particularly glad to be here because uh, it's really um, inspiring to me to see that there is a place uh, on, on my home turf here on the West Coast in the beautiful uh, California coast that actually takes Russia seriously and that is so committed to area studies. I feel like in many ways, um, even though the, the center of gravity of Russia, Eastern Europe, Eurasia work is still uh, on the East Coast somewhere in the Washington, uh, New York corridor, uh, that this is really like the capital of area studies and that I'm sort of manning a lonely outpost in Washington where we're constantly <coughs> under attack. And so uh, it's, really, it's really great to be here for that reason. Um, and I do hope that this collaboration will continue in a lot of ways. Um, 
I'm also going to disappoint you right off the bat by uh, saying I'm not going to explain the Ukraine crisis. I can't explain the Ukraine crisis. Uh, my best attempt to do so you can find on YouTube. Uh, you can find versions of it in Russian and English. And, кстати, я тоже должен извиниться за то, что я не буду выступать на русском языке. Я понимаю, что это главная часть вашей здесь учебы. В следующий раз обещаю. You can also find my, uh, my lecture, a version of this talk, which is uh, probably pretty primitive because it's one that I gave uh, much earlier in the unfolding of this crisis at MGU. Uh, so if you want to continue practicing your Russian, maybe uh, the professor will force you to, uh, to watch that as a kind of uh, penalty. But um, <laughs> let's get started. So I, I like to start from the premise that what we're witnessing now is the most serious conflict between Russia and the West since the Cold War. Uh, it has elements of a war of words, uh, diplomatic isolation, sanctions, of course, uh, freezing, true freezing of practical cooperation and even of simple dialogue. Um, and then more recently, enhanced military deployments by both sides, right? Syria is the obvious case, but not only Syria. Remember, we have NATO deployments now, substantial increases in Eastern Europe, and obviously Russian deployments throughout the region, as well as on Russia's territory. Um, so while things were bad before, I would not have used the term Russia-West conflict until after the Ukraine crisis. Now again, how the Ukraine crisis came to be is very much about Ukraine. And I think one of the things that irks me to no end as someone who's invested a lot of my career in Ukraine um, is people who don't know anything about Ukraine and talking about the Ukraine crisis. The, the reality is we really need to understand Ukraine to understand how the Ukraine crisis began. And yet so much of what's come <clears throat> afterwards, which is what I want to talk about today, is much bigger than Ukraine and has, at the end of the day, rather little to do with Ukraine. And that's an intriguing fact. So why have the leadership on both sides said that this crisis is so important, right? We've been through other crises. We've had myriad other crises, even since 1991. And yet none of them has led to what we now have, which is a conflict between Russia and the West. So let me just quote the leadership. President Obama. Russia's actions in Ukraine challenge the post-World War II world order. Pre Vice President Biden, Russia's annexation of Crimea is a blatant violation of international law. So world order, international law. And then there's this third quote. There is an attempt to perturb the existing world order with one incontestable leader who wants to remain as such, thinking he's allowed everything while others are only allowed what he allows and only in his interest. Who do you think said that? Putin, right? So you actually have a surprising and disturbing consensus on both sides. These are all statements about the Ukraine crisis, that the Ukraine crisis is so important because of this notion of world order, of international rules, of norms. Well, that begs the question, what exactly is the world order, right? What is it that's being violated? Where does it come from? What's it all about? Is it about God? Is it about natural law, as those of us who are unfortunate enough to be uh, bearers of the legacy of law school? Uh, we're taught to think? Uh, is it about the formal, formalistic international uh, lawyer's definition of law, which is practice, that is what states do, and opinio juris, that is what experts say states ought to do? Um, is it public opinion, merely whatever the Levada Center and Pew tell us that people want the rules and the order to be? Uh, is it a document? Is it the UN Charter? Right. The, the answer, of course, is it's all of these things, because it's an inherently amorphous concept, and that's exactly why leaders who are on opposite sides of the very same concept are able to impugn the other side with violation of this order, because it has uh, different definitions and different beholders' eyes. Now, I take an interesting insight from uh, a paper by Yvonne Krastev and Mark Leonard, in which they said that global norms have more often derived from a consensus about the rules of behavior of European states than the other way around. When you first hear or read that statement, it seems like kind of a non-statement. Well, yeah, duh, obviously, right? You know, in the last two, three hundred years, it's been very much dominated by Europe. But you actually think about it, this is an incredibly important insight. What they are saying is, what matters is not some theoretical, abstract, pre-existing world order, right? The thing to which Obama and Biden and Putin and everybody else is referring. What matters is what states in a particular geographic region, and they are saying it's Europe, or call it the greater Europe, Euro-Atlantic, Eurasian space, what they actually do. Because more often than not, is their argument, that determines what the world order is than the other way around. And so how, for example, can bad behavior, behavior in violation of whatever the rules are in this particular space, be a violation of the world order if, in fact, that behavior determines what the order is? 
But this also tells us why that behavior is so worrisome. Because if that behavior fundamentally, dramatically, and permanently changes, that means that the world order changes with it. And that, I think, is why leaders on both sides have a surprising kind of point of consensus around the real reason why there is now a deep conflict between Russia and the West coming out of Ukraine versus so many other conflicts in the past is because it begins to signal the end of a world order in which all of them feel in different ways they have a stake. Now, is this permanent? Is this immutable? Will Europe always be the decider of what the world order is? Obviously not, right? I'm not here to sort of mount some archaic 19th century great game theory of the world. But the fact is, until the Chinas, Indias, Brazils, etc. of the world are prepared to pay the costs of determining what is the world order and then imposing that order more broadly, uh, Europe and North America are likely to remain at least the key forum for deciding the rules of the game. So, in conclusion to the opening, Ukraine represents the breakdown of an order in Europe that was best characterized, I think, by the Helsinki process and the Helsinki Final Act. People talk about the post-World War II order. Well, that didn't become clear until at least uh, a quarter century after the end of World War II when nations got together, in fact, every single nation, uh, both blocks in the Euro-Atlantic space, uh, and conducted the Helsinki process. Um, and the breakdown of that set of norms uh, represents not only a problem of European divergence from world order, from international norms, but the inception of a breakdown of that order itself. Okay, So that's kind of the basic intellectual premise I want us to be on, on that page as I begin to go through sort of some perspective and then what I think maybe we can do about it in a really modest and possibly impossible way. Um, so first, good news. Uh, there was a Helsinki process. It's very good news, because actually the Cold War was, objectively speaking, worse than the period that we're in right now, and anybody who remembers even a small part of it will agree with that statement, I think. Um, so the Cold War, one way or another, birthed the Helsinki process. We wouldn't have had it without the Cold War, which in turn birthed the Helsinki Final Act, and what's now the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, which may be very imperfect, but it's the only thing we have. So it begs the question. If the current conflict gets worse or stays at least as bad as it is now, um, is there going to be a recognition of a need for something like a new Helsinki process, a new security framework or a renewed security framework, as happened during the Cold War? Um, one way of putting that question, or let's say the first uh, lens through which I'd like to look at that question, is um, how much does the current period resemble the Cold War, and in particular the part of the Cold War that gave rise to the Helsinki process? So now let me go into a list of similarities. Uh, these I credit to Bob Leipold, uh, who has a, a well-known foreign affairs article on this topic and will shortly have a book out, um, uh, basically called The New Cold War. And by the way, I'm not endorsing this list, but I want to share it with you again to make sure we're on the same page. So number one, there's been a real shift in rhetoric. There are high levels of propaganda on both sides and real demonization of the other, right? You know, this is obvious stuff. If you read the Russian press, if you read the American press. Um, the narrative has become that the other is solely at fault for provoking the conflict. In other words, there's not a lot of introspection. It says, here's what we did wrong you know, on, on the American side. The Russians saying, well, we, we could have handled this better. It's pretty much, this is how the crisis was created, manufactured, and worsened, and ultimately is being prosecuted right now as we speak by the other terrible side in this conflict. Low expectations for cooperation is the third point. Uh, tit-for-tat punishment of one another, for example, sanctions, breeding counter-sanctions, breeding counter-counter sanctions, and then updated sanctions. It seems like uh, almost without any specific provocation, we just are, are pushing one another back and forth into these punishing steps and counter-steps. Um, freezing of the bilateral presidential commission, which a lot of people laughed about as kind of an empty instrument to sort of all show and no go. That may have been true, but it was the vehicle by which American and Russian officials at all levels from secretaries all the way down talked to each other, and now they are formally banned from talking to each other. Sarah can attest, she was just at a conference with me. We had very high level Russian officials flew all the way out to the west coast of the United States for a conference celebrating a historical kind of shared um, experience of Americans and Russians around Fort Ross, which is now more than 200 years old. There was not a single U.S. government official there. Why? Because that is officially U.S. policy. But let's not forget, of course, from the Russian side, they've been throwing out all kinds of uh, U.S.-supported NGOs and exchange programs and so on for the last couple of years. Of course, the NATO-Russia Council is frozen, no longer doing military-military dialogue, except in very rare cases. And I think of all of this in this kind of sad, ironic context. You guys have probably heard of the new movie, The Martian, that's out. Um, I read the book. It's a great book. Highly recommend it. 
Um, but I, I think that's about to happen to poor Scott Kelly and Mikhail Karnienko, the uh, astronaut and the cosmonaut who are currently circling the globe in the International Space Station. I feel like as this conflict gets worse, they're probably going to get abandoned and go spinning off into deep space, and uh, it's not going to be a very fun movie. Um, because, because literally it's true. We have stopped talking to each other, even about things that are obviously in our mutual interest, like space exploration and uh, peaceful exploitation of space. Um, fourth on the list. Proxy conflicts. I would not have included this two years ago, but now because of Syria, I'm much more prepared to do so. Not only in the post-Soviet space, right? We know about the degree to which post-Soviet so-called frozen or not so frozen conflicts have become proxy conflicts. We know about Donbass. We know about Georgia, South Ossetia, Abkhazia. But look at Syria. Syria looks like nothing so much as a Middle East war of the 1960s and 70s. You literally have the Russian side arming one side, the American side arming the other, and you may or may not, I can't, I can't prove this one way or another, you may or may not have actual Russians and actual Americans in combat on the ground or in the air who might be killing each other right now. That is walking closer to the line than we have done for at least three decades, and that's very, very scary. Um, and then, by the way, you have another kind of battle for influence going on that doesn't involve guns and bullets so much, but in places like Belarus and Kazakhstan, Turkey, Hungary, Venezuela, uh, Cuba, other places where there is a battle that's being waged with financial, diplomatic, uh, moral, media, and other terms trying to sort of push the politics more in one direction or the other. So that kind of battle for influence is very reminiscent of the Cold War. All right, so much for similarities. There are others, but that's my representative list. What's different? Number one, and most significant, I think, for me and many others in this room who speak Russian, who hang out on the Russian internet, who have Russian friends, we're coming out of a period of unprecedented engagement of the world by Russia and of the world with Russia, right? This is not the late 1940s. What Russia was coming in the late 1940s, the beginning of the first Cold War, the Cold War, Russia was coming out of a period of unprecedented isolation. Right? By its own decision, the revolution, collectivization, the great terror and the war itself really isolated Russian society. Not so today, right? Internet penetration is very high. And in particular, when you think about the young generation, we see an uncurated version of Russians. You think about the Cold War, sure, there were loads of exchanges. There were plenty of official delegations of the peace committee of this, that, the other thing going. But it was always a carefully curated, carefully organized view of this is Russia, this is the Soviet Union, this is America, isn't it great, let's show you the high points. Now we see each other warts and all because we see each other the way that our friends here or our friends there see each other. You can't curate Facebook in that way as far as I know, but maybe some technical geniuses can do it. Um, Moreover, post-Soviet Russia has been basically, basically a free society, albeit with real limitations on political freedoms and some very deep and dangerous domestic political trends, but very different from the Soviet Union in that sense. Uh, and I believe, and I could be naively optimistic about this, that the connections that have been built through the opening that has occurred over the last 25 years are going to be more or less sustained. That you can't just flip, you can make them harder, you can attenuate them, but you can't just flip them off like a light switch, no matter how much either government might want to do that. Um, now, this is an important point. If you ask yourself, sort of probe your, your heart on this, I believe that the perceived threat of escalation to direct military conflict, and in particular nuclear conflict, between Russia and the United States is still lower now than it's ever been. I mean, it might be a tick higher than it was two years ago. <coughs> but no one realistically thinks in this room or anywhere else that that is very likely to happen. Certainly not in the way it was when we were all doing, I say this in California knowing that there are other reasons to do it, duck and cover drills during the Cold War, right? We're still doing those for earthquakes, but uh, you know, people had a clear and present danger in mind during the Cold War, that this was a real possibility. If we're honest with ourselves, neither on the Russian side nor on the American side, is it a real possibility now? And that carries important consequences, which we'll talk about in a moment. It's particularly not not perceived as a real, uh, real possibility among the youngest generation, among people who never experienced anything resembling the threat of escalation of this sort of, you know, two minutes to midnight kind of thing during the Cold War. Third, there is no global ideological struggle that is part of the current conflict. Basically, basically, I emphasize, we agree about free markets. We even agree basically about democracy. We have a dispute about the details, right? But by and large, the Russians are not offering up a comprehensive 
alternate framework <laughs> to free market democracy or the Western way of life. They have disagreements about American behavior in the context of that system. And then fourth, there is a massive and indisputable power imbalance between the US and the greater West on the one hand and Russia and its allies on the other. And that's true measured by almost any, any indicator with the exception of nuclear weapons. The United States is coming off a century of hyperpower status where there simply was no rival to the United States globally. And what that means is, um, again, I, none of this is intended to be critical. I'm not taking sides. This is sort of a factual description of the landscape as it exists now. What it means is we're just not in the habit of deferring to anyone who is our equal because we didn't have any equals. So we're really not in the habit of saying to a China even, to an Iran or certainly to a Russia, well, what is it that you'd like to see and how can we accommodate that? Very different than the Cold War, where we had no choice but to accept that reality. And let me give you just a few facts and figures to illustrate that. In 1980, the United States GDP was 2.8 trillion, roughly. The Soviet GDP, you know, official figures was 1.2 trillion, but we know that most of the Soviet economy was actually not properly monetized, so you could easily multiply that by two or even three. So roughly speaking, economically, there was there was parity, or there was near parity. Uh, 2013, the US GDP, 17 trillion. The Russian GDP, much more monetized than it, than it was before, maybe not 100%, 2 trillion on a good day, right? Maybe closer to 1 trillion today. So seven to 10, 10 to 20 fold greater just the United States, and that's not counting the European Union. Uh, NATO versus the Warsaw Pact during the Cold War, rough parity. In fact, if anything, a conventional advantage in Europe, at least on the part of the Warsaw Pact. Uh, NATO versus Russia and you know Belarus, which is really its only reliable ally, mostly because it has troops there, um, about 20x superiority, I mean, depending on how you measure. And that's even theater specific. There's, there's almost no theater in the entire NATO area of operations where the Russians can bring more force to bear within a, a discrete period of time than NATO can if you count all of NATO's assets. So it's an overwhelming, overwhelming disparity of power. Again, that has a very important implication, which may be obvious to all of you, but we'll get to that in a moment. So what does all of it mean, right? That we're, we're in a serious conflict, there are some similarities to the Cold War, and yet it's clearly not just a repeat of the Cold War, and it's clearly not similar in all respects. Well, I think the upside is that re-engagement and some kind of return to normalcy should still be possible. In other words, we're not locked in some kind of death march to self-destruction. But that would entail finding face-saving steps, like in particular an exit for Russia from Ukraine. Um, and the Russians are going to have to find that. I'm, I'm a little bit heartened by developments I've seen in the last two to three months that look like maybe they're looking for it right now. Um, it's going to have to entail, in response, a gradual easing of all but symbolic U.S. and EU sanctions. So in other words, it'd be naive to think that there's any state of the world in which all the sanctions would go away, but maybe some of the sanctions could be eased in response to something that looks like a real Russian withdrawal. Um, and I think all of this would be facilitated in some way by cooperation on a third country issue, so a Syria issue. Uh, an Afghanistan issue. I was much more hopeful, obviously, about cooperation on Syria until about the last three, four weeks. Uh, but again, I think we could be surprised at the direction that that takes. Now, that's the upside, pretty limited, pretty short. The downside is much bigger, I'm afraid to say. Um, the downside is this, and, and refer back to some of the points that I made about the difference between today and the original Cold War. The stakes are still not high enough for either side to be compelled to make the concessions necessary to achieve a useful compromise or consensus. Mm. For example, if you think about Helsinki. Helsinki, the Helsinki process was coming out of a period of the Cold War where every year brought an escalating crisis that came closer and closer to war. Think about it, starting with the Berlin crisis, flashpoints in 56, 62, 67, on and on, right? The Vietnam War raging at the time the Helsinki is convened. So the very notion of seeking a detente, of seeking a dialogue, came only because the alternate option was so obviously unacceptable, right? And the key to understand, the absolute key, if you take nothing else out of my talk today, please just take this. Today's alternate option doesn't look that bad for either side. And that's why it seems like the downside is that we are not going to have high enough stakes to motivate concession, compromise, dialogue, any of those things. Mm -hmm. But there's more. 
during the Cold War, sworn enemies, and when I say sworn enemies, I mean people who campaigned for political power through whatever system on the premise of defeating and destroying the other guy, right? So sworn enemies, declared enemies, Kissinger, Nixon, Nixon Brezhnev, Reagan, Gorbachev, they all worked together famously. They actually had relationships of relatively high trust, at least working level trust. They didn't love each other, but they, they were able to work together. Look at the personal relationships today. They could not be more dysfunctional. They are caricatures of a dysfunctional relationship, and they lend themselves to political cartoons accordingly. And of course, structurally, the domestic politics on both sides are constructed now to favor confrontation over compromise. Just, just look at the situation in Russia. The centrality of the nationalist narrative in Russia and the threat narrative, the American threat narrative in particular, to Putin's legitimacy, it's absolutely central. In other words, without those things, I don't know, what, what does the narrative look like? I couldn't even tell you. So he'd have to tell a story about the economy, or he'd have to tell a story about the South Caucasus, or he'd have to tell a story about you know, sort of the great Russian culture, and all of those things look a lot less appealing in the second decade of the 21st century. But the threat narrative, he's kept us safe. Right? It reminds me of my watch keeps tigers away. Do you see any tigers? Right? Um, it's absolutely, I'm not trying to be so dismissive and make fun of it, but it is absolutely central. U.S. politics. Think about what Obama did in 2009. Right? He announced a huge political initiative, made a big political investment in this thing called the Reset, Right? authored by our own Mike McFall, who's just two hours north of here, um, and, and invested a tremendous amount of political capital in it. Now, whether you think the reset in particular paid particular dividends or not is beside the point. The political zeitgeist right now, objectively, measurably, and I can pull up political science uh, uh, surveys to prove this, does not view the reset of, as having been a success. Nor does it view Obama's broader engagement policy as having been a success. The proof is in the pudding, by the way. Every single candidate, with the exception of Bernie Sanders, who is running to replace Obama, is running to Obama's right on foreign policy. That's all the proof you need, that everyone who matters in American politics is now structurally convinced that they must take a hard-line approach on any foreign policy and diplomatic issue, and Putin and Russia will be number one on that list. So, uh, given all of these limitations, is anything resembling a new Helsinki possible? Um, obviously, a necessary but not sufficient condition is resolving the Ukraine crisis in some way or other, and a resolution that's going to require endorsement of some kind by Russia, the United <coughs> States, Europe, and of course Ukraine itself. Um, stopping the violence has always been the first step. It's been the first step since the beginning of the violence. Um, the sad irony is that we have always had an incredibly perceptive and strong ability to see when violence is coming. Right? I can find you an op-ed or a, uh, a journalist's article predicting almost every phase of escalation before it has taken place. So we know what's coming. But when we do an extremely bad job of acting to stop it. So the answer is we have to actually invest something in the tools that we already have, like OSCE observers on the ground, the Minsk framework, etc., to try to actually implement the preventive strategies that we know are there and that we know could work. Let's not be complacent because without doing this first step, and again, I don't want this to become a lecture about the Ukraine crisis, without doing that first step, nothing else that I've talked about will be possible. This is a sine qua non of any further progress. But what else would we have to do? Well, this is, I realize, a very uh, uh, sensitive statement, particularly in Washington or, or in Europe, but I believe that no progress of, of the sort of macro uh, kind that I've described will be possible unless we declare an informal moratorium on competing integration projects in the post-Soviet space. Why is that so important? Because I believe that the core of the crisis we're dealing with now is the result of a predictable train wreck between two competing integrationist visions for the space. I'm not judging which one is superior to the other, which one Ukraine has a right to in sovereign terms, which one it deserves. That's beside the point. As long as the two of them remain there and continue to exert diametrically opposed pressure, countries like Ukraine, but not only Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, are going to suffer the same fate. So I'm not saying throw away the hope and future of a Europe whole and free of a Lisbon to Vladivostok, but try to find a way that you can declare a moratorium in the context of which you can negotiate something that looks like a renewal of Helsinki. Otherwise, you're not going to get it.
And what is the content of that renewal? Well, for example, we have to reaffirm the principle that borders can change only by the mutual consent of the mother country and the regional population, and only by peaceful means. So that seems like a kind of um, esoteric scholarly statement or, or international lawyer statement, but what I'm really talking about is Crimea and Kosovo. From, from the Western side, the view is everything has been hunky-dory until the Russians annexed Crimea. They broke the rules, and now they're threatening the whole framework within, the rules, within which the rules exist. From the Russian perspective, the narrative is very different. Everything was hunky-dory until the West pushed for Kosovo to break away from Syria and broke all the rules in the process of doing that. So the only way in which these two visions can be reconciled, and again, I'm not weighing in on which one is right and which one is wrong. That's irrelevant for purposes of a dialogue between these geopolitical blocks. The only way to reconcile the two, though, is to find a way that you can turn them on their head and make them what we call in international law persistent objections, that is, exceptions to the rule, rather than indicators that the rule itself has changed. Because if the rule has changed, and the new rule is Kosovo, whether you like Kosovo or not, and Crimea, whether you like Crimea or not, we're in for a heck of a lot of trouble in the Europe of the future. That's really the key premise here. We have to reaffirm the principle that military forces cannot be deployed on another state's territory without the consent of that state. Another basic, basic Helsinki Final Act principle. But simply saying we believe in this principle isn't going to mean anything. It's going to have to be demonstrated through a commitment to some kind of concrete confidence-building gesture. And I think the example here, both the easiest and most practical example, uh, and I think the most powerful example, because it's the most emotionally laden right now, would be a complete and verified Russian troop withdrawal and Russian uh, uh, sort of formal Russian presence withdrawal from Donbass, from at least that part of Ukrainian territory. And I, and, I, and I name this specifically for a reason. One, I already see the Russians moving in that direction for other reasons, which are entirely their own interests, but nonetheless it's happening. And also because we have an OSCE presence there already, which has already been authorized and legitimized by all the OSCE countries, including Russia, which could verify it. And verification is critical. Whereas if we chose something else, uh, we might not be able to, to, to make it happen quickly. So, of course, none of this can happen in isolation. It needs to be in a larger framework, um, a European security settlement a la the Helsinki process. What would that look like in the second decade of the 21st century versus in the 1970s? Number one, unlike the 1970s, I don't think it can be led out of Washington and Moscow. I think it has to be led out of Europe uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, even if the United States wanted to take this on, so let's say Tori Newland decided this was going to be her project for the, for the year that she has left or that her administration has left, um, I think that very quickly our political focus would be drawn away by something else, like a crisis in the Middle East, Asia, a global problem like climate change and, and related consequences, cybersecurity, etc. In other words, the United States doesn't have the bandwidth that it did during the Cold War, and that bandwidth is not as single-mindedly focused on Europe. Um, Russia, for its part, uh, I think seeks acceptance and participation in institutional Europe, um, especially in security issues in Europe, despite its pivot to Asia, despite its commitment to Eurasianism and so on. I'm not saying that's all talk. I'm not saying that's not real. What I am saying is when I go to Moscow, I'm told over and over how important Europe still is to Russia. So I think European leadership in that sense is appealing to Washington and it's appealing to Moscow. And then, of course, What's the compulsion for Europe to do this? Why should Europe dirty its hands with a problem like this that is very likely to continue to be a problem and not be solved? Because I think the costs of worsening conflict and the costs of a collapse, a final, true collapse of the Helsinki security order will principally be borne by Europe, not by the United States, by Europe. And so I think Europe has to lead. Now, why do I think this, this, I realize, tends to be a sort of controversial subject? Why do I think Russia would be receptive to this? After all, we hear endlessly in the American press how much Russia lies and is deceptive and has these grand designs and wants to reconquer its sphere of influence and so on. So why do I think they might want to renew a process which would at least in part entail a recognition of limitations on Russia's ability and rights to do that? Well, I think first you see a signal in the 2008 Medvedev Security Treaty proposal, but it was an impartial. It was a, it was a partial and incomplete signal. Uh, that proposal sounded very much like what I'm proposing, except it entailed only the political and security dimensions of what you might call 
the European, Euro-Atlantic, Eurasian space and not the human security or human rights side of things and the economic and environmental side of things. So without the complete trifecta, all three baskets that make up what we now know of as the Helsinki Final Act, uh, you're not going to get any kind of comprehensive European framework. So not a repetition of Medvedev's 2008 proposal, but, but build off of it. It's take the Russian offer, even if it's late now, better late than never. Um, I think this version of Helsinki would have to acknowledge the reality of regional blocs. So we had regional blocs in the 1970s, we have them now. But now they're called the European Union and the Eurasian Union. And again, whatever you think about them, they're real things. And so they have to be recognized and they have to play some kind of role in this process rather than imagining and pretending that we live in a world of perfect Westphalian sovereignty, which we obviously don't. Um, the United States, as I've said before, can't cast a giant shadow, but what that means in practical terms is another very controversial statement. And again, if you guys don't see why this is controversial, I'm so glad for you, because it means you haven't spent a lot of time in Washington. Um, we're going to have to swallow some intra-European deals that run counter to our values, our stated principles about freedom and sovereignty and you know equal rights of all people, small and large. Guess what? When Europeans get together and cut grand deals, they almost always throw those kinds of things under the bus. And we're going to have to be okay with that, otherwise Europe isn't going to get this done. Again, a controversial statement, I think. And then lastly, I think we have to figure out a way to engage civil society much more meaningfully in this 21st century Helsinki than was done in the 1970s Helsinki. And I think in part because civil society is much more visible and much more active. How you define that is, is a whole topic. I have a, a colleague who's written a wonderful book about it. But the basic idea is we need to figure out how to spawn a civil society process that is then sustained and also bless it from the side of government, but without controlling it. And that's something governments tend to be really bad at doing, particularly the Russian government, by the way. They love the notion that they're civil society, as long as they know absolutely everything is happening in the civil society and they control all the groups that are involved in it. So by way of conclusion, right, and I've offered nothing resembling a comprehensive solution, just a few ideas, uh, I hope provocative ones. Um, 2015, this year, is the 40th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Act, right? So it's been four decades since we've had anything resembling a kind of grand concert of Europe bringing together European powers to talk about the state of affairs in Europe. I think the Ukrainian crisis uh, provides the incentive for taking some kind of urgent, renewed focus on this issue. I agree with the premise that we began with, that it does genuinely threaten the world order, because I agree with the idea that for now, at least, that world order is largely defined within the Forum of Europe. Perhaps by the 50th anniversary of Helsinki in 10 more years, uh, there will be a new consensus. There will be new global actors that can help us determine a durable, truly international, stabil uh, stable uh, security framework without Europe. But for now, that's not true. Uh, so let's take this conflict seriously uh, while we have the opportunity, and let's try to make some progress. So I'm done. Thanks.